we have Daniel Rowe with us again today. And so today Daniel is going to uh, be covering a volume divergence, um, I wouldn't say system, but component. Today is our official announcement of Daniel. Uh, so he is our recommended third party partner that I actually feel good about recommending to our customers if they need work done for them, if they want to hire somebody to build their system for them quickly. Daniel offers other services. You know, if you want to get some personal one on one training, Daniel can do that for you as well. But I'll let Daniel kind of explain that in full detail. So Daniel's going to take uh, about uh, a few minutes to introduce himself, you know, what he offers, um, and, you know, who he is. And then he's going to lead us into today's theme, which you can see the chart here. Um, so today's theme is, you know, how to build a volume divergence component here. Um, and he also has some other miscellaneous volume stuff that he's going to show you as well. With that, I will um, turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Zach. Hi, everyone. So, yeah, several of you have been asking if you could just pay someone to design your custom blood down strategy template for you, or even get some extra one-on-one -on -one training. That's exactly the service I'm now offering. Name the business, trade the plan, and you can find the website here at www.trade-the-plan.com. And this is just a screenshot of the site. Uh, look, I completely understand the learning curve issue here with Bloodhound, uh, you know, which is really an issue associated with learning any new piece of software. So if you're having a slow go of it and you just want to get your strategy up and running as soon as possible without, without having to fully understand all the ins and outs of Bloodhound, I can now do that for you very, very quickly and very affordably. Uh, if you just want to get some help improving your strategy or if you, you, know, you want to just make sure um, that what you built is done as efficiently as possible and if you, you know, like a little help optimizing it or if you're stuck on something that's just too difficult, too time consuming to figure out, then please don't hesitate to contact me. That's, that's what I'm here for. Uh, this is going to be a very, very affordable service to all Bloodhound users. Uh, all right, that's that's the extent of my sales pitch here. <laughs> I had about a five-hour presentation prepared, but I'm not going to make you sit through even one half hour of any of that. Uh, you're here to learn, and I'm going to be teaching you some pretty interesting stuff today. Yeah, so this is the this is what we're going to be covering in the actual workshop today, and it, it's probably going to take us a little while to go through it. So these are the volume conditions that we're going to be solving for. And like Zach was saying before, let me just kind of run through all of them so you can just kind of see. Like he was saying before, Bloodhound isn't set up to, to do these types of mathematical calculations. It, you know, it's, it's looking at one indicator versus another. So what you have to do is when you're looking for some of these conditions as, uh, you know, two times is volume is the current volume bar, is it less than two times the previous bar? So if you're wanting to solve for that, you need to create an indicator to do that. And it's, you know, I learned how to do it. It's, it, it takes a little while just to learn, but it's really not that hard. The, the logic is super simple for this indicator. And let me just show you quickly where to get it. So I wrote this um, article on big mics, and let me, uh, I'll give you guys the link to that, and it discusses what I'm creating here today, so, you know, after the webinar, or sometime over the weekend, you can go and read this, and, you know, then come back and watch the uh, recording, so, that's the article, and I've posted the indicators there, so in order to, when I finish this template, and I send it out to you guys, you're going to have to first go to Big Mike's and you know you can use your free account at Big Mike's. You don't have to be an elite member. And download these two indicators here. Let me just show you. So you don't need the vol SMA. Uh, 
the vol MA that comes with NinjaTrader uses an exponential moving average. This one is just using a simple moving average, but you don't need that because I'm not incorporating it into the template that we're going to create today. Uh, it is incorporated into the template that you can download here from Big Mike's, but you also need the better volume indicator, which is on Big Mike's, but you have to be an elite member to have that. So and that's why I'm kind of creating uh, the template a little bit. It's somewhat of a simplified version, but it, it really works better, in my opinion, than the one I posted here on Big Mike's. So these are the two that you want, the vol standard deviation band and the vol max multiple. And I'll get into exactly what these things are, are doing in a second. Also, I wanted to show you this because if you want to learn more about the concept, Linda Rashke did a webinar for Big Mics, which you can watch here. And then she also did a webinar for uh, Trading Pub, which you can watch here. And she goes into a little detail about uh, volume divergence. Now, the way that I've set it up, I'm actually requiring that price make a lower low or a higher high for it to be considered divergence. She's not doing that. She's she's allowing for you know coming out of if you were putting in this low here, she would allow for a retracement that doesn't break the lowest low. So it could just be, you know, a 50% retracement as long as it's on less volume than you had at the low. And then, you know, she would allow for a long trade there. So, um, yeah, these are the conditions. Uh, now this one is, let me just show you on a chart. I think this will make more sense as I as I do this. So this second condition here, this with the standard deviation band, what I did was I chose 388 minutes because I'm using a one minute chart and I'm using the RTH session, the regular trading hours, okay, because I don't want the overnight because it skews, you know, because of the overnight volume is so low, it skews the moving averages. So I don't want that. And what I also did was I eliminated the first and the last bar. So the bar immediately after the open and the bar right before the close because those bars are always giant volume bars. So I eliminated those by creating a, a custom session template. And I thought about not talking about this because it is, you know, somewhat advanced, but it's so simple to do. Let me just show you in the next, you know, 30 seconds how to do it. So go to Tools. Session Manager, and you can come back and watch the recording and pause this. You know, there's no need to, to get upset if I go through this too quickly. Uh, so open Tools, Session Manager, open up um, in the Session Manager, then create new template, name it whatever you like. Let's just say I'll name this RTH minus one minute. And then you'll click on Add, Monday. Here we want 9.31 a.m. to 4, I'm sorry, 3.59 p.m., okay? Uh, I know the futures close at 4.15, but the volume dries up at 4 o'clock, okay? Okay, and then right-click on it, add Monday through Friday, save it, and you're done. It's that simple. And then from the data series window, you go to session template, and you just select that template that we created, which is the same exact one as the one I've already selected here. So no need to change it. And that's it. All right. So I selected 388 minutes for the period of this standard deviation band here that I created which is called volume standard D band, okay? So it's only plotting the moving average, which is a uh, 388, um, so next, no, it's a uh, simple moving average. And then a standard deviation, standard deviation band of 2.25 and 388 minutes because that's the number of minutes in the session, okay? So 
Um, that would be the second condition here. Okay, and the third condition, well, for, let me, okay, the first condition is this guy, this little yellow one. So what it's doing is it's measuring the previous volume bar. Okay, that's why the period is set to 1. And the input is here. I'll show you this as I build the chart, but I just want to kind of give you a brief overview of what this is doing. So you just use volume as the input series. And it's multiplying that previous bar times 2. You can see volume is the input. And then I displaced it 1. So you can see here, um, right here on this bar, hopefully you can see that well enough. You see that little yellow hash right there? That is showing two times the previous volume bar. Okay? Now, in this case, the condition is true because the current volume bar that you know I'm showing you right here is greater than two times the previous bar. Okay? So that's that condition. Now the third condition is using the same indicator, but Instead of using volume for the input, I'm actually using the volume MA. This should read volume MA, not SMA. Thought I'd change that. So the volume MA comes as a standard indicator, which is right here, right below volume. It's the first one below volume. So that's an exponential moving average of volume. Okay? So that's what this uh, cyan line is doing. It's Two, well, it's 1.5, it's 1 sorry, 1.5 times uh, the volume moving average 30 period. So this, okay, sorry. This little cyan line is a volume moving average 30 period, and the big cyan line, dotted line, is 1.5 times that line displaced two bars. Okay, this is probably going to confuse you big time, but as I build it, this will all make sense. I want to give you a basic overview of it now so that you'll understand better, you know, as I'm starting to build it. I don't want it to, you know, shock you because some of this stuff is kind of advanced, I guess. And then this last condition is showing you the highest volume bar. So it's basically the max volume of the past 60 bars which is kind of why I named it volume max multiple, because you can set the multiple to one, and it will just give you the highest volume bar. It will mark the highest volume bar of the past, you know, X number of bars. And that's this black line. So what's cool about this is I'm using the same indicator to do all these different things with volume. And that's the volume max multiple indicator. That's what this is doing. It's a little small yellow dash. It's showing you uh, two times the previous bar, volume bar. This one is showing you 1.5 times the volume moving average. And then this black one is marking the highest volume bar in the past, really it's the past 65 bars. And I've used 65 because there's, um, there's a recurring hourly cycle in the S&P. And as long as you set it to over, just over 60 minutes, uh, you can usually catch pretty much all of the volume divergence signals, okay? So that takes care of that. And then this last one is showing you all the bars that are below, all the volume bars that are below, that are lower than the maximum volume of the past 60 bars. So basically, it's the opposite of, of marking this bar. It's marking every other bar. So it's basically not going to mark, how should I say this? It's going to highlight every bar that is below this black line, okay? Because that's what volume divergence is. You get an outlier event, which um, I should show you on a chart here. Let me. This is the initial event that we're solving for. This is point A. This is the initial high volume event because volume has broken above the standard deviation band. Okay, so that signals us to, okay, something's going on. There's a lot of volume coming in. 
and we're making a new high, right? So that's the initial event that we're pushing forward. We're going to extend that. When this becomes true, we'll extend that forward, and this is the point at which we get the signal, okay? So at that point, the volume has to be lower than it was at the initial event, okay? So that's what that last condition is, is for. As long as the volume is below it, then technically you've got a volume divergence. Does that make sense? So you're making a higher high, but volume is lower than it was at the previous high. All right? So let's give you another example. So this is, um, you know, me using it on the uh, actual chart. So you can see here you've got the volume divergence. But here, it's with a low. So you've got uh, an initial high volume event there at this low. And then you've got another, it's higher volume. I mean, it's high volume here at this low, but it's less than the previous low. And this is another one. This is really a double bottom. And it's not using that, because that's the first bar of the session. We're eliminating that bar now. It's really using this bar. So. Um, that's that's the divergence. This is the initial high volume event, and then this is the entry right here. This is the entry signal. Okay, so this is uh, the chart that we'll be looking at. As I develop this template, uh, this is what I want you to have in mind, okay? The first part of the signal is going to be this point A. Okay, now what that associates with on the template is this part right here. This is the volume spike. This one is uh, showing you when you're making a new high within the period of the donkey and channel. So in this case, if the high is equal high of the bar is equal to the upper Donkian channel, then you are making a new high in price for, you know, the said period, which in this case is 65 bars. Okay? So if both of these are true, then you're making a new high or a new low on a high volume bar. Then we're going to extend that signal forward, and then we're going to eliminate the first six bars of that. And I'll explain all this as we go, but I want to give you an overview of what we're doing because this is complex. And, you know, you're not going to, maybe you don't understand it right now, but you'll have a better chance of understanding it as I'm building it if I give you a brief overview of it now. So if you don't understand just yet, don't worry. I'm going to explain this in great detail. Okay? Now let me just wrap this up and we'll start building it. So this is the logic of what we've got going on here. So from that template that I just showed you, this is the logic involved inside of those solvers here. So like I said, the volume spike, uh, if the volume is greater than 2.25 standard deviations of a 388 period volume, simple moving average, then it gives you both a long and a short signal. And when the high of the bar is equal to the upper channel of a 65 period Donkian channel, it will give you a short signal. And if the low of the bar is equal to the lower um, Donkian channel, then it will give you a long signal. Okay? And then, so that's our initial condition that we're pushing forward. We're going to extend that 66 bars, and uh, we're going to eliminate those first six signals so that it, it won't take an entry uh, within the first six bars of this event because, um, you know, you want to have at least some room for a pullback, right? So I'll explain all this. And then these are the, uh, the price conditions. So here, just, you know, for the entry, either closing price inflection or the close has to be uh, greater than 55%, so greater than, you know, the midpoint plus 5% for a long or less than uh, the midpoint minus 5% for a short. And then uh, this is the Donkian condition. 
saying that you know it has to be uh, making a lower a lower low or a higher high. Okay, and then these are the subsequent conditions for volume at the entry point. Okay, so rather than continuing to bore you with an explanation of it, let's just build the thing, shall we? Now let me bring up Ninja Trader. I will open up a new chart. We'll do the ES. One minute chart, I'm only going to use about 10 days back. The less number of days back that you use while you're building the template, the better because it will enable the solvers to update a lot, a lot more quickly. Uh, if you use a, a higher number of days back, then it, you know, the solvers have to calculate through all that data, so it takes a long time. So this is the template we're going to use for the session, 931 to 359. All right, and a blank template. So I'm going to find that one place, because this is what I want you to keep in mind while we are building this uh, signal. I think that was it. Let me just double check because it you know it helps to kind of design it while looking at a chart so the you know the method makes sense to you. So yeah, this is the spot. All right, let's add Bloodhound. Let's add all the indicators. So SI Bloodhound. Um, I'll go ahead and add, actually, let me just add Bloodhound and Volume first. And then I'll put Volume above Bloodhound so I can kind of keep Bloodhound, you know, somewhat out of the way here. And uh, so now the indicator that I created, the first one that I'll add is the Vol Standard D band, which is right here, Vol Standard D band. So what you've got to do is you've got to include volume in the input, because right now the input is price. You don't want that. I didn't overlay it onto volume because I was using it with uh, a better volume indicator. So I gave the option of you know using whichever volume indicator you wanted to use. So we're using a 2.25 standard deviation of a 388 period, mm, excuse me, moving average. So we want to overlay this on volume. So we need to select the panel that volume's on, which is the second panel here. Let me just add that so you can see it. What is that? I didn't select volume. <laughs> I was telling you all about it. All about it, but I didn't select it. Okay, yeah. Open up the input series. Click in here, select volume, and you're good to go. So there it is. So you can see, let me just do this. You can see all the spots where volume is breaking out of the standard deviation. Now Linda, she talked about using a four, uh, the fourth standard deviation. So she might get one signal every few days or a week or something like that, but I'm just using a 2.25 standard deviation for a really long period, um, just so you can kind of see a lot of examples, a lot of signals. Uh, really, this should be a little bit larger. You would probably want to use at least, you know, I don't know, two, two and three quarters, or you know, three or higher, probably uh, would be best. I think you would probably get more accurate signals that way, from what I found. So now let's add the other volume conditions that we are solving for, which is the volume max multiple. I don't know why I named it that. It was the best name I could think of at the time. So this, for this one, uh, let's set it to 1, because we're only going to look at the previous volume bar. So we want to show when that 
uh, current bar is greater than two times the previous bar. And here we need to select for the input series volume as well. So let's do that now. And then overlay it on volume. Here I'm going to set this color to yellow. There you are. I use a width of one. Okay. I think everybody can see that. So you see what I did? I didn't displace it. So right now, let me blow this up. Right now it's just showing you two times the current bar. Well, it's yellow, so you can't see, but it's 2,400, so this is 4,800. So it needs to be displaced one. And then we can see that the yellow hash now is two times the previous volume bar. So the condition will be true on this bar because volume is greater than the hash. Okay? So that's a pretty quick and easy way to begin using volume analysis in Bloodhound is with this one simple little indicator. And you can yeah, use this. May I interrupt for a second? Yeah, please. Um, I just want to point out real quick. So Tony, Tony's been asking about how to how do you uh, detect when you get a volume spike that's you know, double twice what the previous volume is. Um, oh, okay. He's been asking that like um, months and months ago. Oh wow! Um, and so Tony, here you go. Basically, Daniel has kind of created an indicator, modified an indicator to um, to find this condition that you're looking for. Yeah. So, all right, Tony, so, you know, get in contact with Daniel mm -hmm. uh, if you need further help, right? And so this is what you've been looking for um, last summer. So, just want Absolutely. To you, Tony. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just send me, a, send me an email, Tony, and I'll, I'll send it to you, or you can download it from Big Mike's uh, at the link I put in the, uh, the, the message pane there. So, Right, so now we can use the same indicator. We can do all sorts of stuff with this thing. So volume max multiple. Again, now I'm going to show for the past 65 bars, and I'll leave the multiple at one, I want to show the highest volume of the past 65 bars. So basically the max volume of the past 65 volume bars. So again, I need to add volume. in the indicator pane. I'm sorry, in the input series window. Right, and then the panel. Second panel again. I'll leave this black this time. What did I do wrong? Oh, there it is. Okay. So you see what's happening here? Right. So from here, previously, before this volume spike, the highest volume bar of the past 65 bars was here. Because you can see this was obviously uh, 65th bar here, and then 66, 67, 68. And then, you know, it, it will find the next highest volume bar you know, coming down so you can see here, the next highest bar was right there, which is this bar here. And then after that, the next highest bar was this bar, which is marked here. Okay? So we're using this to notify us that um, volume is indeed below this line. Okay? So volume is less than the, the max volume of the past 65 bars. Okay, you could also use it, uh, you know, you could displace it, you could show when volume has broken the highest volume bar of the past 65, you can do anything you want. I mean, you know, just 
think up some stuff and test out volume. Volume is one of the most underrated, undervalued indicators, I believe. And it holds, well, I'm not going to talk about trading. But yeah, I love I love volume and I love volume analysis. Okay. And I think it's it's uh, very necessary for profitable, but whatever. So volume max multiple, let's add it one more time. Actually, let's add the volume moving average, which is an EMA of volume. Let's set this to 30. That's already using volume as its input, so we'll just overlay that on volume. Let's change the color to cyan. So now, let me just make this dot, dotted line. Um, we want to show one and a half times this line. So we want, you know, basically like a um, moving average band, but different, you know, because it's going to be a steady rate. It's always going to be one and a half times greater than the volume MA30. So that's what we'll use this. What happened? Volume max multiple here. Uh, we'll set it to one because we've already got the moving average. The moving average is already set to 30, so we'll set this to one, and we want to. So one and a half times greater than the volume moving average. Input again, volume. Mm -hmm. And panel, second panel. Uh, let's keep the width. Let's change this to cyan as well. Actually, let's make it. Uh, let's make it red and the dotted line. So what we're going to do with this, uh, the thing is, is, you know, with an exponential moving average, when you have a new bar come in that's a spike in volume, that moving average is going to change instantly on that bar. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to displace this two bars. So I don't want, um, you know, there to be a low volume region and then an initial volume spike that's really high, I don't want it to skew the data of this line for the first two bars. Okay? And you know, I don't need to get into why. Just just know that that's the um that's what I'm after here. Why is this thing not working now? Let me just close this. Bring it back up. There we go. Okay. So what did I do? I didn't use <laughs> the input. I used volume as the input. That's a big mistake. So we need the volume MA as the input. Set that to a 30 period because that's what we are trying to show one and a half times uh, the distance from, right? So that little cyan line that you can barely see, I need to change that color. So now you can see it. I haven't displaced it yet, but I'm about to do, do that here in a second. So you can see, uh, let's hit, uh, let me make this a line rather than a hash. So you see this, it is exactly half again as, as uh, large the distance is half again as big as the distance from zero to the volume moving average. And you can see that pretty clearly. Let me change this color to a dark. I'll just do a dark violet. And I'll change this one to a really dark red. Okay, hopefully that shows up a little bit better. Actually, I shouldn't waste time doing this, but it's going to take us a long time to get through this. And, you know, you guys don't have to stick around. You can come back and watch the recording. This is going to be one to watch a few times, I would imagine. Because, you know, you can take this template and then you can kind of work through it 
And just by working through this, you'll be learning Bloodhound. You know, and that's kind of how I learned Bloodhound was getting some of the templates available on the website and not even watching the video and just kind of working through them and trying to figure out what's going on and and that's basically how I learned, you know, also watching the videos as well, but really more um, trying to figure out on my own what's going on. Uh, it takes you a lot longer, but once you learn it, you've got it, you know. Uh, when you're just watching somebody do something, you're not really learning. You think you are, but it's not registering. It's not staying. You know, you, you need to do it. So uh, all I can recommend is when you're watching this video, build it as I am building it in the video. Okay, and that's the best advice I can give you for learning Bloodhound. Build it as Zach's building it or as I'm building it here. Okay, so now we're going to displace this too for the reason I was talking about because it does kind of skew the data you see right here. You know, it's immediately skewing it. So I want to know when that volume is um, breaking out but basically breaking out from the moving average a couple of bars ago. All right. So now really the last condition we need is the donkey and channel. And the donkey and channel, you don't really hear a lot about it. I mean, some people use it. Um, it's pretty cool. It, it's useful in a lot of different things from what I'm discovering. So I'll leave the mean on there just to kind of show you. So what it's doing is it's showing you the high and the low price of the period specified. So here we're using, you know, we're using a one minute bar, so we're using 65 minutes. Okay, so it's showing you, say this is the current bar right here, it's showing you the high and the low of the past 65 bars and the mean the halfway point. All right, we don't really need the halfway point, so let me just make it transparent. So, you know, the less clutter we have, the better. I know this looks pretty cluttered down here on the volume, but we're going to use every one of them. So, let's get on with it. Let's build this sucker. All right. So I'm going to go directly to the logic board. I'm not going to mess around with trying to start off here in the solvers tab because we need the logic board. You know, you got to have Bloodhound Ultimate for this. You got to have Bloodhound Ultimate for you know doing anything uh, complex. It, you know, I, I. I couldn't use the other versions. Blood out ultimate makes so much more sense for you know building systems. So we need a comparison solver. We're going to be using a comparison solver pretty much for every single condition that we're building, except for the closing price inflection, and that will be an inflection solver. So as I was saying two weeks ago, uh, the comparison solver is the one I use the most. It's it's obviously my favorite. I mean, it's, you can do so much with it. It's in, really incredible. So here, we're using volume. So we don't need to go find volume in the indicators. We can just use the, uh, the little drop-down window, the little, uh, uh, you know, just helping you get to it so much quick, uh, quicker. And easier. <laughs> I'm getting tongue-tied here. All right, so volume and then the standard deviation band. So this is our initial condition. We want to show when volume has broken out of that standard deviation band. So here. Da -da 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 -da. Volume standard deviation. And then we need to layer, we need to nest the volume into that. Right? Because we're doing a standard deviation of volume. I mean, that makes sense, right? So here, we need to set it up. We're doing 2.25 of a 388 period bar uh, 
Yeah, we're using the band. Okay. Let me just connect it and name it. <laughs> mm, excuse me. Okay, so what am I doing here? Yeah, so I need to name this volume. We'll just name it volume spike, I guess. I'll just keep part of that. So we're comparing volume against the standard deviation band. So really, we're not trying to get a long or a short out of this. We're trying to get both. So we're not determining direction with this bar. We're just showing we just want to signal when we get the event. So we don't need you know, when A is less than B, A is volume, B is a standard deviation band, we only want to show when A is greater than B, right? Because A is volume, whenever it's greater than B in the band, we want to signal that bar. So we need to set both the long and the short to the same condition, A greater than B. Okay? Really, you don't need but one, but we'll just, you know, it comes to fault. Um, zero text or zero picture more, depending on whether you're using a large amount or a small amount. So I've done a lot of work uh, in explaining this solver. I would recommend watching every single thing that he's done on the comparison solver because there's so many different nuanced ways to use this. And um, it, it's a little com complicated. and it took me a little while to understand it. I thought I understood it, and then I got to a point where, hmm, what's what's going on here? Uh, when trying to do, you know, both longs and shorts out of the same solver, a lot of people, from what I've seen, working with a couple of people, uh, watching how they'll set up stuff, they'll use one comparison solver to do a short signal, and then use another one to do a long signal, when you can do both of them out of the same solver. So a lot of people will use two when you only need one, right? So I recommend watching his tutorials on the comparison solver. That should be, uh, if you're new to Bloodhound, that should be uh, some, of the, some of the first videos you watch. Now, so that takes care of it, right? We're showing every single time the volume is above that standard deviation band. Right, right here, we didn't quite make it out, so you can see. So that's pretty cool. There's your volume spike. Now, what also has to be true during this event, this initial high volume event? Well, it also needs to be making a new high or a new low. How do we do that? You could do that with the SI swings highs, lows indicator, or you could use this donkey channel. And I find this to be um, a bit simpler. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So we need another indicator comparison. And here, what we're going to do is this. Basically, when the high equals the upper band, you're making a high. You're making a new high within that period, or you're making a double top. And likewise, vice versa, if um, the low is equal to the lower band, you're making a new low or a double bottom within that period, and this, the period being 65. Uh, you know, price never breaks out of the donkey end channel, so you need to set it up to equal to. All right, and how do you do that? Let's first select the high and the low. Okay. So to do that, the let down comes, you know, like we were talking about before, you need everything in indicator form to work with it in Bloodhound. So it's not that you can't do things in Bloodhound, it's just that you need, you know, the information in an indicator format, right? 
So I mean, it's not like you can just type in you know what you want in code in the Bloodhound. You have to use the the uh, output from an indicator. So here, SI Chameleon, which comes with Bloodhound, gives you access to all of the data points of the bar. I mean, anything you could think of, really, obviously. And you can also look at uh, the data points on uh, different instruments. So if you want to look at the NASDAQ versus the S&P, you know, are they both making new highs at the same time, or is there some kind of divergence between the S&P and the NASDAQ, or the Russell, or whatever? So, like I was saying, if the high is equal to the upper, then we want to give a short signal. Okay, if the low is equal to the lower, then we want to give a long signal. So that's how we're going to set this up. Low for longs, high for shorts. And the look back period is one, so that's the current bar. All right, now for indicator B, we just need the donkey and channel. So I just click on there and hit D, and it takes me right down to the Ds. Click on the donkey and channel and set this to 65. That's what we're using. So for the upper, just like for the high, we want a short. And if the low is equal to the lower, we want a long. Now, as it's set up right now, let me just name this. High, low, equal, upper, lower, donk, 65. That's a comparison solver. <clears throat> okay, so in order to set this up for equals, right now it's set up, you know, for a long is the low above uh, the donkey and lower. And you know, it, it mostly always is unless it's touching it, right? So and then vice versa for shorts, you know, is the high less than the upper. So let's get back to our little example here, the spot that we're looking at, which is right there. Just mark it. Okay. So we need to get rid of that. And we just want to know when it's equal to. So what would that be? That would be neutral, wouldn't it? So for long, set that to true. And then for a short, you'll see uh, some short signals come in where the donkey and channel where the high is touching the donkey channel upper band here. See that? So every time the high is touching the upper band, we're getting a short. And every time the low is touching the lower band, we're getting a long. And you can do a lot of stuff with this. Just, you know, just experiment. Um, I've managed to come up with some pretty cool stuff using the donkey and channel on price and indicators. I mean, that's how I did the divergence template. And I'm really surprised by how, how well it works. It's, uh, somebody should design an indicator for divergence using the donkey channels. So, all right. So that's that. So we need to show when both of these are true. Now, the problem is, What if you know we get that high volume event, but um, it happens that the next bar, like say, what if the high volume event happened on this bar? You see that the high is not touching the upper band. So if the high volume event happened on that bar, and sometimes it, it will happen like that, you'll get a massive volume bar, but a really tight range. That's the definition of what they call churn volume. Really high volume for X number of bars for said period with a really narrow range. So that means you've got a lot of people in there. Uh, you've got a lot of big limit orders sitting there, and all the market buying or selling 
is, you know, it's not moving the market because of all those limit orders. Okay, so sometimes that will be the case, like, you know, right here. Okay, so how would you account for that? You would want to extend the signal from the high equaling the upper band forward just a couple of bars, just to make sure that you're accounting for the cases when uh, that might happen. And see, that's the thing with a lot of this system building. A lot of what takes me the longest is going back, finding all the places where uh, the signal was missed because of something, you know, some condition wasn't met, and then kind of making little adjustments here and there to uh, to really filter out some of the, the, the signals that shouldn't be made, and then add in some of the signals that are not being found. So that's what can, can take a, a long time, and this is one of those kinds of things. So this is something that needs to be accounted for. So we're going to extend that signal forward just a couple of bars. Like We'll set it to 3. But when you set it to 3, it's really only extending two more bars because it's including the current bar in that extension. Okay, so when you set it to 3, it's going two more past the initial bar. So 3 including the bar, current bar. Okay, so we want to now signal when both of these conditions are true at the same time. What is that? It's the AND mode. So let's do that now. Connect these together so both of them have to be true at the same time. And there we go. So now when we're making a new high in the donkey and channel, in the 65 period donkey and channel, and we're making a volume spike, it's going to give us a short. If we're making a new low within the period of the donkey and channel, it's going to give us a long. Let me see if I can find a couple of examples here. There's one. I'm going to try to be open, though. But look what happened. So just this condition alone is, how can I say, it's useful information. So I'm sure a lot of you are excited to see how you can begin to incorporate volume. A lot of people just don't know how, for one thing. It's confusing. I think there's a lot of disinformation about how to use volume out there. It's designed, well, I don't know, whatever. But I think it's important. So otherwise, I wouldn't be showing you how to do this. So now, the next step, think about it. What do we want to do? So this is the initial event. But our entry needs to be, I mean, what is volume divergence? It's that initial high volume event, but then you want to take the next uh, you know, let me say this. This is one version of it, okay? Some people would say that, well, you don't need to make a higher high. It could be just a slightly lower high than the previous high. Um, and I actually do it that way, too. I'm not going to show you that today. I'm showing you when you're actually making a higher high than the previous high where you had the high volume event, okay? or you're making a lower low. Either a double top, double bottom, or a lower low, or a lower high. And that's what I'm going to show you today. So this is really only one aspect of the concept. It's one way of doing it. Don't to run out of water here. So think about it. What do, what do we need to do? We need to extend this initial signal forward. How many bars? Well, let's extend it forward 65 bars, because that's what we're using for the donkey and channel for all this other stuff. So now we need to extend this whole entire signal forward 65 bars. Okay, first of all, this signal extender, it has resets on it. So if you want to reset, you know, let's say you're, you're extending the signal, but something happens and you don't want to extend that signal anymore, you can set up a reset condition. Now, you can have it reset from the input, which is, you know, you've got, you've got the input, which is the condition you have coming into it. 
So you could signal, uh, you know, when you get an opposite signal from the input, that would reset it. Or you could reset it through the reset connection here. And uh, you could have, in, you know, reset on opposite signal. Well, let me just show you. You've got all these different options here. So this is, these function nodes are really, um, what enable you to do so many different things with your signals. This stuff is just ingenious here. They've really just uh, accounted for, for everything that I can think of. Um, this signal counter node is really cool too. I'm going to get into that in a second. So you can do just so much stuff and so rapidly. I mean, watch, watch how fast we'll build this together. You know, what would it take to program this hard code? I, I have no idea to be honest with you. Probably a very long time. So 65 bars, we're going to extend this. Now we do need a reset for this. Okay, but first of all, we don't need any reset for that, so I can just set that to false. All right, now on this guy, actually, yeah, I mean, if, well, obviously, if we get an opposite signal within those 65 bars, say, okay, it's going up, it just made a new high, we get a high volume event, then it comes straight down, makes a new low, on a high volume event. Well, we want to reset the signal then, obviously, right? So we don't need the reset. We need input opposite signal. So when we get an opposite signal, like I just said, if it's, you know, we get the initial signal at the high uh, for a short, and then it comes straight down within 65 bars, makes a new low on high volume, uh, on that signal, which would be the opposite signal, we want to reset the signal extender. Okay, so input opposite signal because it's coming in from the input. Okay, if I was doing that from the reset, I would choose reset opposite signal. And I'll show you that uh, when I set up the signal counter here. So let me show you how this works. So there you go. It's extending 65 bars. Goodness gracious. So I guess that's the initial event right there. And then you get another one here, here. Let me just mark them, actually. You know what? Let me add There's a neat little toolbar shortcut uh, you can get off of a NinjaTrader support form. So toolbar shortcut. And it'll give us, yes, I need to save this. What um, Forge. Yeah, volume divergence 2013-1122. I guess you saw a glimpse of about a 20th of all the templates I have. Um, so yeah, let me signal these now. I'm just going to give it a little square here. So that's the first one. Stay in draw mode. It's the second one. Actually, that one broke through as well. This one, this one, that broke through. This line bar broke through, so did that one. This one as well. I mean, you can see. So it's extending signal <coughs> 65 bars from this bar. So 65 minutes, it's extending that signal. And then 65 minutes from this bar, and from this bar, and this bar, and this bar, and this bar. So that's no good. We don't, we don't want to do that. We want to break this up, right? Well, also, think about this. When you get the initial signal, how soon afterwards do you want to be able to take a trade? Or right, do you want to be able to uh, have a signal? you want there to be at least a few bars in between, right? So you have room for somewhat of a pullback. Um, what I chose to do for this number uh, previously, I think in that Big Mike article that I wrote, I think I used um, 
11, 10 or 11. But here we'll just use 6, 6 or 7. So what the condition I'm going to make now, I'm going to say when we get the high volume event, okay, and we're making new highs, so the high of the bar is equal to the donkey and channel, I'm going to say eliminate the first six bars. So eliminate, well, I guess eliminate the first signal altogether and the first six bars because that signal is not what we want. We don't want to, uh, you know, that's just the setup. That's just the initial event that we're pushing forward so that if our actual entry conditions, if our actual signal conditions become met, if they become true, then we'll get the signal. So this is kind of the setup, right? So we want to eliminate the first six signals of that setup. All right? And then after that, if our conditions become true after that, then we can allow for the signal to be taken. So how in the world could we do something so complicated like that? Well, that's what this little signal counter right here is for. Let me just blow this up. Okay, so this is going to be need <coughs> going to need to be set up. I guess let me do it like let me keep it an analog. I will set this to six. Let me just kind of show you what it does. So right now, it's counting what? It's counting the signals. You can count non-signals, you can count bars, whatever. We're interested in the signals. It's counting up to the sixth signal. And we're looking back, actually, in this case, yeah, we're only going to look back for the length of uh, the number of signals we're counting up to. It, it doesn't, the look back, look back here doesn't matter. I mean, it, it has to be at least the number of signals you're counting up to, obviously. But uh, in this case, a look back period is um, can be equal to the number of signals we're counting up to because we're getting a signal on every bar. Okay, that's basically why we don't need to worry about the look back period. Um, if we had sporadic signals, like maybe every 30 bars we had a signal or whatever, and we wanted to count six of them, then we, you know, this would need to be 500, 600 bars, something like that, to be able to find all six signals within that period of time, right? Uh, and there, there are a couple of really good webinars on this signal counter. And if you want to limit the number of trades that you take per trend direction or per length of, uh, you know, like, well, no, you could use a session to look for that, a session solver for that. Uh, yeah, per, per trend direction. Let's say you only wanted to take one breakout trade per day. You would use this to do that. And there are a couple of good webinars that Zach has done that explain this in great detail. So I would recommend going on YouTube and, and typing in, um, what would you type? I think one signal per trend direction, something like that. And uh, you'll get a, a few different choices. I would watch all three of them. I, I've watched pretty much every single one of those. Um, I know it takes time, but that's what I do. So here, let's see if I can find where it's counting up to at the beginning here. All right. Yeah. The initial signal is here. And that's the first signal. This is the second, the third, fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. Well, Daniel, I thought we were counting up to the sixth. Why are we getting a signal on the fifth? Well, you see the threshold is set to 0.8. When I set this to 5, that's dividing everything up in, into 20ths. Right? So each signal is going to be 20%, is going to uh, be... Uh, Two tenths. Okay, so at the first signal, the first signal will come in at two tenths because it's basically five divided by one, or one divided by five, sorry. And then the second signal will be twice that, will be 0.4, third, 
0.6 and then 0.8. So if you want to eliminate that, you would have to set the signal threshold to 0.9 or even to 0.1, I mean to 1. Well, that didn't work. I think I need to set it up on uh, Bloodhound itself, don't I, Zach? I think so. It's been a while since I've had to do that. Yeah, so let me um, let me do this. Let me show you how to change that on Bloodhound itself. So Bloodhound right here, you can see the confidence threshold. the long threshold, short threshold right here under signals. Change this to 9 and now the signal will have to break 9 tenths before it becomes active. Okay, so it will eliminate that signal uh, you know, if it's equal to 0.8 or, you know, 0.85 or whatever. So let me just update this. So you can see we changed it. Uh, the threshold is now at 0.9. And we can have it set to five bars and not have an issue now. And not get a signal on the fifth bar. So here, one, two, three, four. I'm sorry, not on the fourth bar definitely on the fifth bar because that's what you're looking for. So here we'll set it to six because that's what we want. It automatically adjusts the look back period for you. So you can see it's scaling down, it's stepping down. Once you hit the sixth signal, then it's turning on, it's turning true, and then it's going to uh, you know, keep it on as long as the signal extender is going. And then it counts down. Pretty cool, huh? So now, it's still not good enough. We need to reset the um, the counter. So how can we do that? Basically, if the volume is um, volume. Hmm. Let's see. Let me think about this for a second. What do we got here? So yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna try something here. So we'll set up another comparison solver. I'm just gonna teach you this one as I go here. So we'll we'll choose volume again. And here we'll use the volume max multiple of volume, obviously. And uh it needs to be set up to 65. And then we need to nest volume into this. All right, so this is going to be our reset for the signal counter. All right, so basically, if the current volume is greater than the max volume of the past 65 bars one bar ago, I know this is going to be kind of complicated to explain, then uh, reset this signal. So basically, if we're, we're extending that signal, the original signal, we're extending that 65 bars, and then we're going to elim eliminate uh, the first six bars of that signal, right? So here with this, what we want to do is if we get another volume bar that is greater than the highest volume bar in the past 65 bars, then we want to reset all of that 
and start over. Okay, so right here, when we're when we're breaking on this bar, how should I set that up? I guess I'll, I'll just ex I'll uh, I'll displace this one so you can understand. So this is kind of complicated. So here. You can see this bar right here is higher than the max the maximum amount of volume of the past sixty five bars displaced one bar ago. Let me just let me not displace it so you can see and then I'll displace it. Basically when it's not displaced, there's no way that you could get a volume bar that's greater than this because this is it, you know, it's working like the donkey channel. The volume will never be greater than this. It'll, the only thing it could do is be equal to, right? As you can see. So right here, uh, it's equal to. So now we displace it one. And uh, so now we can show when a volume bar is going to be great is greater than the maximum volume of the past 65 bars. Okay, and that's going to reset our uh, a signal counter. I know this is this is a a complex kind of a condition here, but um, that's what we need to eliminate that first bar, basically, uh, so that you know we're not able to take a trade when you know we've got another high volume event that's basically reset what we're what we're looking for. So really, when we get another high volume event like this, we need to start over, okay? Because that's broken the previous high volume event because this is higher than the previous high volume event for the past 65 bars. So that means we need to start over. So now we're looking for the next volume divergence. So we need we need to um, uh, you know kind of reset everything, and then here it gets reset again. So it was reset here. And then now it's reset again right here. Okay, so it's at this point after the next six bars, you can see it counting up or counting down to that sixth bar. And then it's letting the signal extender go through and extend those signals for the next 65 bars. I hope you understand this. This is, this is really uh, kind of a neat little way of, of doing this. Uh, I know it's complex, and I'm probably not explaining it very well, but hopefully you can understand what I'm after here. I'm, I'm just looking to reset it when, uh, you know, we've replaced the previous high volume event with a new one, you know. And we'll same this one that's multiple of uh, a volume, obviously, for the past 65 bars. Displace one bar. Okay, I know this is complicated, like I've said a hundred times, but this is important. I mean, you have to have this in order for the system to work correctly. Okay? Well, for the uh, component that I'm building here. This is not a system. This is not a trading system. This is kind of a, a concept. It could be incorporated into an exit strategy. And, you know, let me just take two seconds to talk about this. People don't spend enough time on their exit strategies. That's the determining factor in whether you're going to make money. It's your exit strategy. So put as much time and effort into your exits as you do in your entries. Everybody's always concerned about finding that perfect entry. What does that matter if you don't have a good exit strategy? You know? So just think about that. Keep that in mind. Put put a lot of effort into your exits. All right, so that does it. That is our initial condition. So that sets us up for the volume divergence. All right, so now what would we need to do to have a, a signal? Well, we need a reversal in price. 
Well, how do we do a reversal in price? Well, you use an indicator inflection. And this is so simple, it's crazy. Indicator inflection, it's showing you when the slope changes from positive to negative or from negative to positive. The first bar. It's not a slope solver, it's showing you when the slope changes. Not a gradual change in slope like this. Uh, where is it? Goodness gracious. Indicator change in slope. That's something totally different. This is just showing, showing you the point where the slope inflects. Okay, and we're going to, from the drop down menu, choose the closing price. And this is going to show us every time that the closing price changes from increasing to decreasing, or from decreasing to increasing. So here, that would be where we would want to signal a short signal, right? Because the closing price inflected there. Well, what else? What if we get, you know, what if, what if the price doesn't inflect, but we get a bar that is, you know, kind of like a doji looking bar. It's not, you know, there's no signal really. I mean, it's still, say it's still an up bar. Let me find an example. I'm just sitting here rambling. Um, let me find a good example so I can show you what I'm going to build next. Uh, let me blow this up. Well, let me build the condition and then I'll show you. I'm going to show you with the logic. This is closing price inflection. Now this next one, it's going to be a comparison solver again. This is the only solver that's different. It's closing price inflection. So the comparison solver, we're going to find another price bar condition. So we we want to show when the closing price is greater than 55% of the bar. What do you think this is right here? That's probably 50% isn't it? It might be 55%. So look at this bar. Well, let me just kind of do this. This may not work, but I'll, I'll signal it anyway. So you can see this is actually an up bar. But look what happened here. You had a lot of selling pressure come in right there. And it closed way off of its high. It looks like it closed past the halfway point. So how could you turn that into a short signal? Well, let's try to do that. And we'll set this to closing price. Closing price and in indicator A. Okay, for indicator B, what do we want? Hmm. We want the chameleon, obviously, because we want to find the price points. We want to use the low and the high because we want to find out is the close nearest to the high or nearest to the low. All right, this is pretty cool. I use this in pretty much everything that I've built. Pretty much every single system, except most of them I use like a 60 or 70 percent. This one will we'll use 55 uh, percent. So as I chameleon, once again, and then uh, low for longs and high for shorts. So if a low, I'm sorry, if the closing price is 55% from the low, give us a long. If the closing price is 55% from the high, give us a short, because that means it's closing nearer to the low than the high. I probably just slipped right through, <laughs> right through your brain there. I'll explain it. I'll explain it a little bit more in a second. Uh, let me connect it. So now, what do we have to do here? Well, let's, we don't need, we don't need it. Well, okay. Let's do this. What this, what you can do with these small amounts, large amounts, you can set 
what you're using here. You can choose points, ticks, Rico bricks, ATRs. So what if you're wanting to find you know, the distance from the high to the low of the bar you're looking at? What would you do? Zach taught me this in one of the videos. He's pretty creative with this stuff. Uh, you would choose an ATR period of one. It's giving you the true range of the bar you're looking at. Okay? This is pretty cool. All right, let's just set them both up. I'm not going to go into the difference between this because, to be honest with you, I'm starving. And I've got a long ways to go. You can find out all about this by going and looking into uh, the comparison solver in the tutorials and then the workshops. Just type in comparison solver on YouTube or, you know, on the site. And it'll give you a long list of videos. So, what do we want to do? We want to do 55%, so 0.55. So it's really the large amount that we're working with. We don't even need the small amount. Um, I just do it, I don't know, just for good practice, I guess. I don't know why I do it, to be honest with you. So look, what we're getting signaled now, see that, that one didn't qualify. If I set this to 50%, so if it's closing past the halfway point, it didn't work either, did it? I guess it would have to close right on the halfway point for it to work. Let me see. Yeah. That's not that's not gonna do it. Oh well. I would have to set that to like forty nine or something. Mm, excuse me. So we're gonna keep this at fifty five percent. So that means the close is either on the long side of the bar or the short side of the bar. Okay? So it doesn't matter whether the bar is an up bar or a down bar, if the closing price is closer to the low, give us a short. If the closing price is closer to the high, give us a long. All right. Now, let me um, find some examples where this is actually going to be useful. That's 55% of the high or the low. You might think, ah, this is ridiculous, but no. Very useful because it's going to get you in if you're at a reversal. Uh, a lot of times that that next reversal bar will be gigantic, and you're going to get in way late. When the previous bar, you can see a lot. Say you're at a low. When the previous bar, you can see a ton of buying pressure coming in. The bar is closing almost near the high. It's almost like a hammer, but it's still a down bar. So your system's not going to get along there because it's still a down bar. But you can see there's obviously a ton of buying pressure coming in. And uh, setting it up this way, it would allow it to take that trade. Okay, so let me just find a good example. If I can. Hmm. <laughs> Few and far between, but when it does come in, you'll see why it's useful. See, this is a doji. Well, the closing price inflected there, though. You see? If I were to use a bar direction, bar direction is not going to find those dojis because the open is equal to the close, so there's no direction. Right? So we can't use that. We need, we need a kind of inflection anyhow in price. Bar direction isn't going to give us what we want anyhow. It'll be easier when I build the whole entire signal and then I connect or disconnect this solver to really show you some uh, some areas right here. There you go. Look at that. That's an up bar. And it's actually inflected up. But what is it? It's the high of that move. 
but it's still an up bar. So what in the world? It closed below 55%. So the close is nearer the low than it's uh, than it is the high. Let me just stop and see if there's any questions. I haven't looked to see if there's any questions in forever, man. Um, no, there's not. Okay, good. Maybe you guys, maybe your eyes have just glazed over. And <laughs> I hope I'm uh, explaining this well enough. You guys are telling me to take a break. <laughs> um, no, I, that's all right. I've only got maybe four more conditions to go, and then we're done. So, but do you see how useful this is? This is going to be crucial in, in several examples. So let's do this. Let's connect these together. So what we want with these price bars is we want to show when, um, hang on a second here, what's going on? We want to show when either one of them are true. We don't, you know, they, they can't both be true. I mean, they could, but, well, that would be rare. But we want to show when either one of them are true. So these are the, um, the, the uh, solvers for our price bars. So that's really for our entry bars. And this is the initial volume of that. Mm -hmm. So, all right. But uh, now, what is so for volume? We need volume to be. We don't want to just. Okay, we've got our initial volume event. So take the next reversal bar. We don't want that. You know, there has to be some other conditions involved here. We want. Uh, I gotta find that spot. We want to uh, know when we have another kind of surge in volume, not a surge, but we want to have higher volume coming in at the next higher high or lower low. But we don't want it higher than the previous high volume event. So part of the condition of a divergence is that it has to be less than this previous high volume event. Does that make sense? That's, that's the divergence. You know. Yeah, you're making a higher high or a lower low, but you're making lower volume. I know it doesn't make sense at the low because you're making a lower low and then you're making a lower low in volume, but you know, volume isn't it's not an oscillator, you know. So all right, we got a question. Lynn is asking, have I used the mid channel of the donkey? Yes, I have. You mean in other systems? Yes, I, I've used it in uh a lot of other stuff, actually. It's kind of a way to incorporate a kind of moving fib, you know what I mean? But it's not a 61.8, it's just a 50%, but um, to assess the degree of the pullback, exactly. Mm -hmm. it's all, it all depends on the length of the period, you know? So you can actually have multiple donkey and channels, which is pretty interesting. So yeah, let me get back to this now. So what is what, is, what do we want our volume event to be? Well, let's let's have one. We want volume to be higher than this. Than this, uh, what is this? This is 1.5 times uh, the volume moving average two bars ago, right? I wonder if I should keep it two bars. I guess I will. Yeah, two bars makes sense. So yeah, we need another comparison solver. All right, and we're looking at volume again. This is all about volume. And now we're going to use our volume max multiple again. And we need to, this time, put the volume moving average in there. Right, which needs to be set to a 30 period volume moving average. And this needs to be 1.5 times the previous volume moving average. This is 1 
and then we can um, we can displace it here. Okay, because you can't displace it here. Uh, you can only do that in the regular indicator window from the from the chart. You know, you can only select uh, displacement here from this menu. You can't do it on this one, so that's why we've got displacement underneath here. So we'll set that to two. Okay, so now when volume is uh, greater than this, here, let me connect it. I need to blow this up. So when the volume is greater <clears throat> than this line, than this dark red line, give us a long and a short. So that means I need to change this again. So we want A, volume, to be greater than B, that moving average line. Well, that max multiple 1.5 times the previous uh, volume moving average of two bars ago, of the 30 period. <laughs> it, it gets kind of convoluted, I know, but um, once you start working with this stuff and you get the hang of it, your mind will start to think, you know, like it needs to, like, like the computer needs to, to input all this stuff. But once you start to think like that, then it just kind of comes naturally, you know. It's just like anything, time and practice, time and practice. So, yep, so we are signaling now every time volume is above that line. This basic indicator is really so useful for Bloodhound in finding these volume conditions. It's really just glad I took the time to learn how to right indicators. Uh, I didn't know how to do this previously and then um, I needed to find this, you know, these types of things with volume and so I just, I learned how to do it. Uh, you know, it's, and you know, I was going to talk about the vert, um, this better volume indicator, which is really pretty cool. You can do a lot of uh, different volume uh, conditions with the better volume indicator. Let me post a link to that as well. Here's the thread by Fat Tails. Right here. I highly recommend this stuff. You've got to be an elite member to download the indicator, though. Man, my throat's getting sore. Um, and then here's a PDF about the better volume indicator. So this better volume indicator is set up it's it's giving you a lot of volume conditions based on volume spread analysis. So based on the range of the bar per the volume of, you know, X number of bars back, 10 and 20. And then here's a link to the PDF of the guy who created it, who's Barry Taylor. So hopefully all of you can see that link. We provide us the template. No way. Nobody's getting this template. Yeah, of course, man. Just send me um, send me an email. I'll probably put it up on my website as well. But send me an email. Uh, I'll put it in there earlier, Daniel. Trade the if I can type tradeplan.com. Yes. Okay. Good deal. All right. So let's wrap this thing up. I'm not going to go into all this better volume stuff. Um, there is actually a free one on the NinjaTrader forum. So go to the NinjaTrader forum, type in Better Volume, and it's it's named Better Volume 3. I joined Big Mike. Okay. What else can I do with it? With the, um, the Better Volume indicator? What else can you do with it, you mean? I mean, you're not asking me what else you can do with Big Mike, so yeah. Okay, here's the better volume indicator. What else can you do with Big Mike? Well, when you're an elite member, you can download all the indicators. And there are hundreds of them. Um, I've just recently been working with the GNOME CD, which is looking at cumulative delta and delta per bar. Market delta is the number of uh, orders at the bid or ask 
or the number of orders of the bid minus the ask. I don't know, it's something like that. So here's the better volume indicator. Goodness gracious, we've been going for three hours, y'all. Or no, have we? What time is it? Two and a half. Um, what this is showing you, this better volume indicator, there are, let me see if I wrote this. Um, yeah, here I did write it down. Okay. You can see from the menu there are breakout or climax. So a breakout bar is going to be a long range and a high amount of volume. A churn bar is something I was talking about previously. You've probably forgotten it by now, but a churn bar is yellow. That means it's a very narrow range, <laughs> excuse me, but a high volume. So that means high volume per range. Now watch this. This is called volume per range. So this is dividing the volume by the length of the range. So you can see these yellow bars are high volume per range bars, right? And then this orange one is also a churn bar, but it's for the past 10 bars. So there's really a lot now. The indicator, it gives you, so you need to use a threshold solver. You would use a, a 1 for the strong climax, 2 for the strong churn bar. And this is all on the, on the, in, <laughs> It's in the thread on Better Volume that I posted a link to on Big Mike's. Um, which one is it there? Well, it's one of those links where he's, with Fat Tails is talking about the Better Volume Indicator with alerts. And these are the numbers that he's returned for all of these different conditions. So if you want to show when you know, you get uh, a climax bar. Let me just kind of show you here. So I'll show you in Bloodhound, and then we'll finish this template because it's getting kind of late here. So you would use a threshold solver. Okay. Threshold solver. You're going to add the better volume indicator, which everything that Fat Tails does for free starts with an A and A and a and then use the bar to the data series. So you've got to have a data series uh, that returns a value. Long period 20, short period 10. So if we wanted to use the churn, show only the churn bar, strong churn, that's a 2. So we would set it up like this, 0, 1. Actually, we could just set it up like this. We could really just set it up like this. No, we couldn't either. OK, 0, 1. Two, three, four. The threshold solver, I guess I should explain it to some extent. These values have to be increasing as you go up. So you need to start with the lowest number. If the lowest number is a negative number, you need to start with the negative number here, lowest negative number, and then the highest number here. And it's got to increase as you go up. So that's why I put zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so we want a long and a short when we get a value of 2, because a 2 is a strong turn bar. So we want to give a long and a short at 2. So now we should get a signal every time we have a yellow bar. And you can see we do. OK? So I need to take this solver out. Otherwise, no one will be able to download this template and make it work, because they don't have the indicator. OK. So does that kind of, OK. Let's get back to finishing this. Now, this was our volume of the current bar. Zach told me to write this the other way because it makes more sense, but it, it confuses me. So I'd start with the current bar. So the volume of the current bar, we want the volume of the current bar to be greater than 2 times the volume of 
No, we don't. What am I talking about? 1.5 times ball MA. Uh, what is it? 30 period. Right. Displaced two bars. So, what, you know, when you put a number in brackets here, that's just showing you that it's. That's the number of bars ago in brackets. So two bars ago. And right. So let me get rid of all this other stuff. Okay. Well, let's leave it at a three minute charge and let's see if we can't signal this. Now um we definitely got those two. So we need, um, let's do this. We, we want another volume. We want to use basically either, you know, for the final condition, volume has to be either greater than the volume moving average, 1.5 times the volume moving average of two bars ago, or it needs to be the current volume bar needs to be greater than two times the previous bar. So we'll set up. The condition I was the first condition I was talking about before I started building the template. So we got another indicator comparison solver. Volume. And we want the volume mul uh, max multiple again. And we want to set this to two times one bar ago. So period is one. And we're going to displace it, which will give us one bar ago. So now I need to nest the volume in there. Nest that right in there. <sighs> okay. Um, change this like we have been, because we want to give a long and a short when volume is greater than two times the volume of one bar ago. Okay, so we need to displace this by one. So you see right there, volume on this bar is greater than that little yellow hash line. And that little yellow hash line represents two times the previous bar. So on that bar, volume is greater. Okay, now the problem is is when we are making the low, the low will most often happen on a down bar and you'll get the reversal bar on the next bar. So what we need to do is we need to account for that. It might take two or three bars before you actually turn back up. So we want to show that at least one of the past three bars had this higher volume event. But that also has to be less than the original high volume event. Okay, there has to be a divergence. And you could really set it up to where it had to be, you know, a percentage less. But I'm just going to say it has to be less. Not, not a certain percentage or anything like that. It just needs to be less. Okay, so we, we really need to extend this forward a couple of bars. Our two volume conditions here, our two final volume conditions here. So we're going to do volume. Just saying ball greater than two times the ball of one bar ago. That should make sense. And we'll connect. So either one of these need to be true to take the trade, to take the entry. Um, with an OR node, just like with the price condition. So either one, not both at the same time. Either OR. It's important. And then we'll connect everything together with an AND node at the end. And this is really as simple as you can make this. I like to try to get everything lined up perfectly. In it takes me for forever to do it. It's ridiculous. All right. So um, 
Let me see, let me see. Uh, I guess we'll just extend that forward and then... Uh, we got a couple more conditions we could do, we should do. So yeah, I'm going to extend this. Forward by just three bars. Just to make sure we catch that reversal bar within three bars of this uh, second, you know, lower high volume event. And, um, you know, we don't really need to reset it, so we'll just turn this reset off. We'll set that to three. Okay, I'm getting a question. What are the orange lines? Is that your opening range? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I had just marked I was what I was talking about explaining, trying to explain um, you know, what the high volume meant. I was just trying to show, you know, this obviously here wasn't the final resistance that people were waiting for. That the largest amount of traders were waiting for. The largest amount of traders were waiting for this event, or this this level of support and resistance. Okay, so that's why this one didn't work out, uh, but this one did. So that's something you need to take into account is support and resistance. The areas where you're getting the signal, and that's not something I'm covering in this that's really something that, um, you know, support and resistance, a lot of the things that you'll use to find support and resistance, um, can really, you can't really backtest with them, but some of them you can use real time in Bloodhound, but a lot of them aren't accessible. The plots just aren't accessible, but, uh, you know, maybe that'll all change here soon. Now, so we still need one condition that says the volume is less than the previous high volume. So that's pretty simple. We just need another comparison solver. And we're using volume, but we want it to be less than this time. We want it to be less than the volume max multiple. Uh, well, it's one, but of 65 bars. And we nest that in there. Uh -huh -huh. And here we want less than, so not greater than, we want less than. So now we're changing the long output. So we get both long and the output when volume indicator A is less than indicator B. Whoops. And I'll connect that. So here, and this may seem ridiculous, but it's important. It's only filtering out, like, you know, the initial signal. Volume less than uh, let's check on just the ball max 65 bars. And then uh, I'll let you have a look here. So see, it's just filtering out that maximum volume bar right there. Okay. And I should set this back to not being displaced. So, that really should do it. We could add in a condition. Well, since I mentioned it, I've got to do it now. <laughs> if you um, you want to allow double bottoms or double tops, or you want it to actually be a higher high or a lower low. But first, let's add all of this together. So this is really our volume divergence signal. This is our initial condition. This is the price bar conditions. 
these are the price bar conditions, and this is the rest of the volume conditions for the second, for the main part of the signal. This is the initial signal that we're pushing forward, and then this is the entry signal here. All of this combined. So now let's have a look. Whoa, that's not right. You know what I can do? That's not right at all. I don't think. Well, technically, yeah, it is. But what I could do, let me, let me see here. Let me just think about this for a second. It didn't happen on this bar. Because we've set the counter to six bars. Okay, so that's why we've got that late signal there, right here. All right. Now we set this to five. We'll get a signal there because technically you do have volume divergence there. And this is really, like I was saying before, this is a, a generic way of setting it up and the least complicated way of setting it up. Now, if you wanted to, you know, make it to where there has to be more, there has to be more uh, distance, a uh, larger number of bars in between the initial signal and the final entry, I usually have it set to about a 10 or 11 and then it'll filter all of that out. Now, I, I did something wrong here. This is kind of complicated. Let me, let me take a look really quickly what I have done wrong. Input opposite signal. Input opposite signal. Reset signal. Oh, I didn't set this to input opposite signal. Doesn't really change anything though. Hmm. You didn't filter anything below the mean. You didn't want the trade to start when price goes beyond the mean. So waiting for the, the price bar to actually cross the median line. Julie? That would be safe, but that would also be very late. But yeah, you could set that up. Um, wow, you'd have to you would have to extend. Hmm. No, you wouldn't either. Let's. Yeah, uh, that's a good condition. Let, well, first, let me kind of figure out what what's going. Okay. Yeah, you could. Well, I'll, since you brought it up, I'll kind of show everybody how you could do that. But what I'm wondering is why is this showing a short signal here? There's no way that should be happening. Let me just take a couple of minutes, you guys. Oh, duh, I didn't add in the main condition. Goodness gracious. Okay, so, yeah, we've also got to be making, price also has to be touching uh, we also have to be making a lower Okay, let me get this right. 
So what I didn't connect was, I didn't connect that for the entry, you know, the low of the bar also has to be touching the donkey and low, or the high has to be touching the donkey and high. So, yeah, and this is a good signal, right? Uh-huh. Duh. So, right, for the entry, that is much better. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got to be making a lower low. So that means that the low of the bar has to also be touching the donkey in low, or the high of the bar has to also be touching the donkey in high. So that's why I've also connected this initial condition, just this part of it, just the high equals the upper band or the low equals the lower band. I also had to connect that to this final and then. So I've connected all of this, these price conditions, and these last volume conditions also with this last price condition, which is saying the low has to equal the lower donkey in general, or the high has to equal the upper. Okay? So that's what I was missing. I was like, goodness gracious, the signal is terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's much better. So look at that, huh? Mm -hmm. Look at how nice I am just giving you guys something so awesome. And look at that. You see this? Now let's do this. Um, yeah, I wanted to give you guys something you could actually use. You know, well, you could try to incorporate this. This is not something you're going to enter trades with standalone. And it doesn't make money standalone. So this is nothing that you can trade with by itself, okay? And like I said before, it's your in, it's your exit strategy. Oop. It's your exit strategy that's going to determine whether you're going to make money on a trade or lose money. Uh, let's do this. Let's. We got a signal blocker here, so you can see it's signaling three bars in a row. We don't want to do that. Let's just signal those next couple of bars. What did I say? Let's eliminate the signals on those next couple of bars. We don't need a reset. So all of that and we finally got it done. Five bars is fine. So look at that. Hmm. We got to enter at the very low part uh, of this move rather than at the close of this bar. Why? Because of that little price condition I talked about the close being greater than 55% of the bar. Isn't that interesting? I use this in everything I do. So that's pretty cool. But you know, it's only going to be useful with minute and tick charts. So, or volume charts. So let's just have a look. A couple of good ones. Few and far between, but they usually are pretty good. Now I don't get what is going on there. Okay, that's two. Maybe I should only extend the signal. I don't understand how that's even possible. One. Okay, yeah. If I set this to two, then that would go away. But then I might miss. No, I won't. Let's have a look and see. So, just to explain what I just did there, this is, you know, this is the condition saying that the um, the high of the bar has to equal the upper donkey and channel. So, remember, we extended that a little bit, so we could account for reversal bars that happen after the fact. So rather than extending it three bars, I'm just going to extend it two. And that will eliminate these wild signals kind of out in space. So you see why it's better for an exit strategy than it is really for an entry? I mean, unless you know what you're doing and you've got support and resistance defined very well. And we're only ten days back, so... This is a three-minute chart. Now, we had designed it for really a one-minute chart, so let's go back to a one-minute. I 
I know some of you guys have probably been wanting to do something complex, so this is a little bit that well, a little bit more. I mean, you know, Zach Zach can do some complex stuff. I mean, goodness gracious, the guy's a genius, but there's so many new people now. And for all of you new people, this is not the way we do it. Um or Zach and Jeremy do it and Sean. Um, normally it's, you know, Zach teaching it and going really slowly and teaching you things more methodically and step by step. I'm kind of doing this one gig for um just to kind of let you guys know who I am and to kind of show you something a little bit more complex. So if you're lost right now, you know, I I know you're lost. So don't worry. You can come back and watch this as many times as you want. And there will be other webinars where you can get more of your questions answered and um you know, you can kind of start off slowly and, and build. And you can also go and, and watch all those recorded webinars. So here I'm wondering why it didn't get this one. Oh, it's because I'm filtering the last five bars. Let me change it to like three. There we go. Cool. What else? There's a... So that's a double top. Where'd it go? That's a double top, right? What if we wanted to filter out? We don't want to allow double tops or double bottoms. We want to know... Um, yeah, you're right, Tony. I agree. Um, I think Zach is going to start doing a more advanced room and then another webinar for uh, uh, beginners. So thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Now, if we don't want to allow double tops or bottoms, here we've got another indicator comparison. So we'll do this. We'll set this last condition up. For the donkey and channel. Uh, where we use 65. So remember, for the upper, we want a short. For the lower, we want the long. Okay, so this condition, the logic is going to say if the donkey and channel, if the current donkey and channel is higher, if the upper band of the current donkey and channel, of the donkey and channel of the current bar, so these logic statements can just run on and on and on. Uh, here, let me let me finish building it, and then I'll explain it to you. Donkey and channel. Here. Donkey and channel 65. Upper for shorts, lower for longs. So here, if the donkey and channel of the current bar, which is this bar, if it's higher than the donkey and channel we do this. This one. We're going to look at this one. So, if the donkey and channel of this bar, if the upper donkey and channel of this bar is higher than the donkey and channel five bars ago, give us a short. If it's not, don't give us anything. So, indicator A is the current donkey and channel. Indicator B is the donkey and channel five bars ago. Sean is asking me if I'm still recording here. Okay. Um, so, yeah, donkey and channel, current donkey and channel of uh, the donkey and channel five bars ago. Now, what we've got to do here. So, for a long, we're using the lower one, right? So, we need to use less than. So, if the current donkey and channel lower band is less than the donkey and lower band five bars ago, give us a long signal. 
And if the upper Dantian channel of the current bar is greater than the Dantian channel five bars ago, give us a short. So if it's not, I'm going to just call this Dantian. Well, I'll just name it like it is. Dantian 65. Uh, very minimalist Dantian. Goodness gracious, man. Upper, lower, Dantian 65. Greater, less than. Uh, upper, lower, Dantian. Dantian 65. Okay, so that's got it. So that will eliminate double tops and double bottoms. This is saying that it has to be a higher high or a lower low. All right, and that is the end of our volume divergence template. Whew. Look at that signal. Wow. So how many do you think you can actually use this? Pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Few and far between, but it looked like a good place to exit a trade to me. There's our original one that we were looking for. And there you have it. That is our volume divergence. Pretty neat, huh? Okay, Julie, Charles is applause. Thank you, Charles. Definitely. How do we load it in an existing template as the exit strategy? Hmm, that's a good question, Julie. It'll have to be totally rebuilt. I'm going to be only charging, charging only $45 an hour for one-on-one -on -one bloodhound training. Okay, that's less than half, much less than half of the industry standard. Now, for um, and these rates are going to go up after probably. March or April. And think about this. To get a, a strategy built, you know, hard coded in NinjaScript, that's very tedious and time consuming work. And um, it's pretty expensive, I know. So I can do, well, you know, a lot of the stuff, uh, let's say the average strat. Well, I mean, you saw how long it took me to do this volume divergence. Now, I had to think of how to do it, and that took a while. You know, how to exactly define all the steps, but I'm, get, I'm only getting faster every day, so if you need help with it, please let me know. I know a lot of you guys uh, don't have a lot of time. You know, I devote all day every day to this stuff, so if you need to get your, your strategy up and running quickly, then I'm your man, and I can help you with that. And, you know, a lot of times, we uh, we tend to learn better and we tend to learn really well from kind of reverse engineering things. So when I get you, you know, when I make you a template or whatnot and you get it, when I walk you through it and then you go and you work with it and you build on it and you test with it, that's going to boost your... Um, your capacity with Bloodhound. That, that's really going to help you learn it a lot faster because you'll see you'll see what uh, you know somebody's done that actually knows how to use it well, how they would go about building some of these different conditions that you were thinking about. And then you know you'll you'll get a couple of ideas and insights and whatnot. So it'll it'll really help you to uh, to shorten the learning curve. You know, even if you just got something simple done. So let me know if you need me help. I'm here to help. Uh, I mean, think about this, guys. We now have the ability to to test all of these different ideas and all these different methodologies like that. We don't have to rely on programmers. We don't have to be programmers. This, this is such an incredible tool. I mean, this is worth thousands. You know, 500 bucks is a steal for this thing. So I just want you to know and understand what you've got. It's the greatest tool for the retail trader that's ever hit the trading world. It really is. 
and I'm not trying to sell you because you've already bought it. I'm telling you what it is. So that's it. I'm wrapping it up. If you've got any questions at all for me, uh, let me know.